Hello, and welcome to Out West, the official podcast of the Western Governors Association, a bipartisan organization representing the governors of the 22 westernmost states and territories. I'm Jim Ogsbury, Executive Director of WGA. The Western Governors Foundation is the philanthropic arm of the Western Governors Association. This year, the foundation launched a new program to recognize, reward, and promote the effective exercise of leadership by young adults in the West. The Western Governors Leadership Institute selected 21 young leaders representing Western states and tribes to attend WGA's 2022 annual meeting in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. They had a chance to meet four U.S. cabinet secretaries and participate in a leadership development forum featuring several governors and other prominent national thought leaders. In this episode of Out West, we'll talk with the inaugural class of delegates about their experience at the Western Governors Leadership Institute, and we'll listen to a discussion they had with governors about the importance of bipartisan cooperation and strategies to improve political engagement. Governor David Ige from the great state of Hawaii led that discussion. Governor Ige. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. I couldn't be more excited to have a little bit of focus on the next generation of leaders. We have seen how the youth are making a difference in so many issues all across the country. And the Western Governors Leadership Institute, I believe, will be a game changer in supporting the development of young leaders. You know, earlier this week, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of Western Governors University. And 25 years ago, that was seen as kind of a breakthrough for changing the paradigm of higher education. I really do think that 25 years from now, we'll be talking about the hundreds of alumni who have come to the Western Governors Leadership Institute and is changing America and the world with their leadership. So join me in welcoming a couple of panelists from this year's class. First, we have Brandon Laranaga of New Mexico, Caleb Deshack from North Dakota, Gustav Vanderdam from Arizona, and Samantha Mooney of Colorado. So I'm going to start them off with a softball and just ask them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. Howdy, everyone. My name is Caleb Deshant from North Dakota. I'm a recent graduate from the University of North Dakota in marketing and political science in 2020. And over the last two years, I actually started a tech startup in North Dakota that focuses on connecting K-12 students to STEM education opportunities through video games or esports. So I'm very excited to be here in the inaugural delegation. I'm really excited to be joined by such great people. And I'll pass it on to them. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. We represent our really awesome cohort. I'm Samantha Mooney. I am the delegate for Colorado. I'm based in Colorado Springs. I am about to finish my graduate degree in the last few years. I've been breaking into workforce development in the Pikes Peak region. I've been working directly with job seekers with barriers to employment. Of course, working with lots of folks impacted by COVID and also supporting employers with delivering business services that impact what we do at scale. Hi, everybody. I'm Gustav Vanderdunk. I'm representing the great state of Arizona. I'm a 3L going into my 3L year at Arizona State University, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. I'm getting a certificate in both health law and policy and in law and sustainability, which deals with environmental law and energy law. I have experience working in both the state legislature and the U.S. Senate, where I mainly worked on policy issues regarding public health, namely COVID-19, and education policy. Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Laranaga, and I'm representing the state of New Mexico. My hometown is Las Vegas, New Mexico, but right now I am getting ready to enter my Last year, my undergraduate degree at New Mexico State University, uh, I double major in agricultural communications as well as journalism and media studies with an emphasis in strategic communication. I've always been involved in agriculture. My father worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 30 years, and so I grew up surrounded by hunting and fishing and practicing natural resource conservation, wildlife management, and that kind of thing. Uh, so outside of school hours, <laughs> I am uh, also serve as a board member for the New Mexico Press Women's Association. I'm an ambassador for the College of 
agricultural consumer and environmental sciences in Mexico State University, and then the uh, National Hispanic Scholar. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves. Governor Ducey, do you have a question? Yes, I'd just like to welcome you all here. Say it's very impressive to see such young, energetic people interested in many of these topics. And I'm curious what brought you to WGA and or what it was, whether it was a club or university politics or Greek life that opened your uh, curiosity to these types of issues and participation. Yeah, I can go ahead and take the lead on that. Thank you for your question, Governor. I think for me, one of the most influential organizations I've been involved with for a long time now is the National Affairs Organization. And not only learning about agriculture education and how to be advocates for agriculture as young generation leaders, but learning about leadership and communication and learning about advocacy. And, and that opened the door to a lot of different opportunities and skills and kind of connections and the networking that we're able to do when you're involved in a role like that. Gustav? I um, came to policy world through working in legislatures. I discovered the Western Governors Association through those internships and opportunities, not necessarily through a school or club, but I think that there's not too many organizations out there who actually get things done or actually want to get things done. And I think coming here and, and seeing the power of convening has been incredibly impressive. Samantha? My first job in workforce development was at the end of college with a group that hosted an interdisciplinary workforce conference. And that experience is really pivotal for me getting into the industry. I had the most amazing mentor in that space that you know, he's pulling together national leaders, but he would always take me to lunch afterwards, and I could ask him every single question that I had, and he'd always take the time with me to answer those. For me, I think student government was the biggest driver for professional development in college, and that actually culminated for me in experience. In the state of North Dakota, our state board of higher education actually has a student member who gets to vote on the state board of higher ed amongst the other seven members, and so... On my fifth year of college, Governor Bergen and his team appointed me to serve on that board, and I was able to learn directly from a great group of individuals. And that sort of cultivated and created a long-term relationship with the governor's office and other uh, really high-profile, exceptional leaders in the state, where I was then connected to the WDA organization. And it's really important to understand how all that plays together, and I think our state does a good job of promoting internal leadership and growing young people to be the next leaders in our state. It's difficult to import them when it's so cold in North Dakota. <laughs> Thanks, Caleb. Boy, that was a setup or was that a setup? Governor Brigham, you had a question? Each of us governors probably spends close to half of our general funds on education, K-12 and higher ed. And I guess I would just ask the whole panel if there's ways that we can expand the student voice. I think all of us have probably got legislators who have a lot to say about what, the way high school was 40 years ago when they were there, and it was just fine. We shouldn't change it. But I think when we're spending these kinds of budgets on education and there's so much transformation happening in the educational front, I mean, broadly from a policy standpoint, I'd be interested in what the four of you think we could do to get more student voice in the state government policy decision? You know, I, I think a great place to start would be in our STEM communities and our STEAM communities. So frequently, you look at school systems from August to May, you can participate in not just one sport, but multiple sports. But from August to May in most states, there isn't a STEM activity that can occupy your entire school year. So we, in many states, represent and celebrate three sport athletes, but we don't have three STEM athletes, right? Three season STEM athletes. So having that technological voice at the table and cultivating that is a really important priority, I think, for states because leadership is going to come from different areas. We talk very frequently, and many of you ask questions on where are these cyber leaders going to come from to protect our utilities, to protect our power grid, to protect against ransomware. And quite frankly, I just don't know if we're cultivating that at the K-12 level and then bringing that into the higher ed level. And so identifying programs and policies that support the cultivation of young-minded tech people, I think, is really important. Of course, I'm a little biased with a STEM company, but I think it still is really important. Samantha? Uh, I appreciate this question a lot. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is challenging the authenticity of what does that representation look like? Are they in the room while these conversations are happening, or do they actually have a voice that you heard? I can think back to a lot of different opportunities that I've had on different committees and things. And, you know, I was so excited to get to 
dive into the policy and, you know, spend so much time reading and understanding for it not to be a respect member of that. I would also say, too, in thinking about what's really going to create longevity in those solutions from students is looking to teachers who can see those trends that are happening, you know, year after year with students. Like, listen to the teachers. They probably know what's going on and, you know, what the students really need. Thanks, Samantha. Gustav? I think one of the things that we learned was the power of convening being one of the best tools that governors have and one of the most powerful. And so kind of building off Samantha's point, I know that there's some really good models for including young people in decisions that are being made. To do that, I think Hawaii actually has like a youth legislature. So those young people get excellent experience around those people and they get to deal with the tough issues and come to their own conclusions on those. I also think when it comes to internships, especially state legislative internships, I think including a stipend so that every kind of family, every kind of kid can be involved in a state legislative internship. It's not only limited to the people who can support themselves at that age and just making them more available and advertised. I know working in the legislature was one of my favorite experiences and probably the most beneficial. Thanks, Governor Little. Politics itself is not the most secure uh, uh, career path, but there's a lot of other places where you can be engaged in policy. And, you know, if you could tell us what could we do to help motivate them to get more involved? A place I'd like to make a suggestion in starting is there's a lot of boards or organizations in our towns, our communities, where the next youngest person who serves with me is about 40, and I'm 25. And so quite frequently, I'll go to UND alumni events, I will go to community events, and I will be the youngest by 10, 15 years. And it's really difficult to get involved when you know no one in the room, you feel out of your depth almost, right? And so something that we do at UND, thinking that the Western Governors University could look at if they don't do already, is having that young person be represented at the table inviting. And that's something that you governors have done an exceptional job this week of doing is giving us an excessive amount of time to ask you questions. And, you know, when you have so many important people here who may be donors or have policy questions or important issues, you've given us that time. So something that you can literally do that's free, no money, which I think people love in policy, is making sure that there's representation at the table and identifying in which room, hey, we don't have anyone that is a recent college graduate and that's who we serve. That could be a step forward to get those young people out and about and engaged is by making sure that they feel welcome in those spaces. Nanda? Throughout my undergraduate, I did a lot of work in nonpartisan voter education and civic engagement. And, uh, you know, we would always say, if you're trying to convince someone to register to vote, their freshman year of college is where we need to be a lot more foundationally. There's a lot of interesting research, you know, that says if it's before the age of 10, you're able to have a positive civic engagement experience, so you participated in something that went successfully, then, you know, you're that much more likely to be a lifelong voter, you know, engaged in your community. Uh, so something that I think is really interesting, and I've seen a lot of impact with working with younger kids, is participatory budgeting projects. There's actually a nonprofit that you know, supports the development of it. We had quite a big project in the Phoenix Union School District where there's a piece of the, the school's budget that, you know, is allocated for the students to be able to organize and vote on. And the solutions that come out of this are, you know, just so interesting in that I've seen it done, uh, you know, mostly at the high school level, but all the way down to kindergartners deciding that, you know, their most pressing issue is that they need permanently painted hopscotch on the playground because it takes too much of their time drying it on every day. So I think that's a really creative way to engage, and I think a, a great way for departments to come in. We used to even be able to have like real voting machines be able to come into the high school where they had to submit a ballot, they had to submit budget proposals. They can really, you know, have a lot of layers to it, and you know, seeing the students see, you know, within just a school year from start to finish, uh, it's huge and can give that positive experience. Any other questions from the governor? Not students, do you have anything you would want to ask the governor? In the theme of wrapping up this annual meeting and this event, we've had a lot of discussion about 
young leadership and young leaders and how we can, you know, find more involvement through our young leaders. My question for you, governors, is what message do you want us to take home and share with our peers and with our fellow constituents? What is it that we can do as representatives of this organization to go out and spread that message? Governor Pulis. The biggest ahead. thing that your peers and everybody's experiencing is this breakdown in civility and, and this challenge to democracy about both parties working together and this seeming division. I think the most important message is not about any issue, but it's that people work together for the common good. I mean, we don't even have our party labels on here because it doesn't matter. We're the elected governors of our state and we're looking at water and fire. It's not about, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal or Democrat or Republican, that doesn't stop a fire. It's about the science-based mitigation you need to do, the preparation of your communities, the fire response. And on all these issues, I think just re-inspiring faith in our small D democratic process around working together across party lines towards a common good, which is, you know, certainly the, the Western way and hopefully the American way that we can find our way to. Governor I'll just close with one anecdote that I remember from my race in 2014. I was at the Coco Nino Women's Republican Club in uh, northern Arizona, and this sweet elderly lady, Lisa Hendricks, about four foot ten, came to the podium. She could barely see above it, and she said to everyone before the meeting, "Who runs the world?" That's the question for today's meeting. So we went through the entire program, and she came up at the end and said, I'll tell you who runs the world, those who show up. And I thought it was a good message. She was basically saying we have a chance to make change in the state through participation. What I've seen, unfortunately, in many levels is people just punching out, getting lost in their phones or in some other pursuit. And, of course, public life and public policy shouldn't consume really anyone's entire life. But I do think participation is important in anything you can do to get young people to be involved, and not so much just in a partisan cause, but in the solution, in the problem solving. I think we'd all be better served. I'd echo the uh, two governors that just spoke uh, here, here to both of those comments. But I would say to the group, the cohort, this is the most young people we've ever had, or it's been fantastic. So uh, <laughs> we hope that people would keep coming back and keep those voices being heard. Thanks for being here, and, and thanks for helping keep this program off in the right direction. At the conclusion of WGA's annual meeting, Anna Thielen, Western Governors Foundation advisor, caught up with several more delegates who shared their experiences from the Western Governors Leadership Institute. The Western Governors Association relies on great leaders, people who provide direction in times of uncertainty, who make decisions when things get hard, and who demonstrate a deep commitment to the welfare of the West. They also understand the importance of creating and developing new leaders, young people who share their dedication to positive change. And that's what the Western Governors Leadership is about, working together across generations, across party lines, and asking, how can we make the West, this place we call home, a little better? Gustav Vanderdonk from Arizona talked about what it takes to create change and what he learned about leadership from the governors and other delegates. One of the interesting things that I think we heard was about lasting change and creating a lasting impact. And we've heard from a lot of governors who governed in a lot of different situations who all essentially agree that to get anything done that lasts, you have to be bipartisan. It has to be widely accepted. And really, that's the best practice for making change. There's a lot of people who like to use the policy games as a way to score political points or to cause fear and division. But these delegates and this meeting is all about what will work for the West in the future. And the focus on that has been really refreshing and has allowed for really amazing discussions with some of the smartest people you'll meet. So it's been a great learning experience, great opportunity to engage with leaders, with other delegates, with governors, and it really has been a wonderful time getting to know these people and getting to learn about these issues. Skylar Ballard from Idaho discussed the impact of interacting with various experts during the inaugural forum and annual meeting and the potential the future holds. 
we all have distinctive passions and our own field of interest and study. And it was kind of incredible because you get these amazing, distinctive experts of their own fields that you get to communicate with. I had the privilege of speaking with the head of the Idaho National Laboratories. And for me, being a native Idahoan and being super interested in the energy sector, it was just an incredible opportunity. And that wasn't the only people who get to meet. The CEO of Tri-State was one of our speakers. And it was quite incredible to be able to talk about renewable energy systems and political outlook on those systems and of all the different problems and machinations that are involved in that. And I think it was an incredible learning opportunity and an opportunity to grow and develop as an individual within that field just by getting the chance to be around and associate with those people. As delegates, we're all in this tertiary beginning phase of our lives and potentially our political careers. And so when you get to hear panelists and they're talking about how they have become successful and the things that they've done in their own sphere and where they started and where they're going and how we can try and emulate some of their steps, I think that was profoundly helpful. Aspen Lenning from Oklahoma shared a memorable moment during WGA's annual meeting where she met Dennis McDonough, Secretary for the Department of Veteran Affairs. I wanted to talk to him afterwards, and he was gracious enough to talk to me. But I just wanted to talk to him about the absolute success that the VA had brought to my grandfathers. They both served. They both have had a lot of health issues in their later years, and they have both got astounding care. And he stopped, and he talked to us. He asked questions, and then I was actually lucky enough. He gave me a challenge coin, and he gave me one for each of my grandfathers, and I cannot wait to share those with them. Gabriella Smith from Washington spoke about what it meant to her to engage with the governors and listen to experts discuss veteran affairs, which is her field of work. Being a vet corps member for the Washington DVA, I was able to listen to his perspective on clinical outreach during the panel with the Secretary of Veteran Affairs, and I personally work with clinical to community practices in the community through the Washington State Arts Commission with veterans doing music therapy. So to hear his perspective throughout all the states, additionally with the newest addition of the suicide hotline, 988, it was just inspiring to hear that there is so much growth within the veteran affairs. Samantha Mooney from Colorado emphasized how engaging with the governors helped her better understand the foundations of being a public servant. We heard a lot of difficult situations where governors had to make difficult decisions. But we also learned you need to leave your ego at the door to be able to get things done. Part of the Leadership Institute where I felt really inspired was getting to hear from former Governor Rahmer, where he was really speaking to what it takes to lead and hold very different people together. And what is your role as a leader? You're not just doing it to get attention, but how are you really instilling your values of your community of solving problems. And a part of being able to be in this program is getting to attend different events during the annual meeting. And so I got to follow up with him on that conversation later on at the reception, speaking to my current work in workforce development, where of course at the local level, it can feel bogged down. You don't always have control over what kind of funding is coming through. You don't always maybe feel that it's addressing exactly what your community needs. But from that conversation, you really left it with deep inspiration for what I do and wanting to come back to my community and think beyond just the problems that are right in front of me that I'm working on, but how am I really rallying the folks around me to make a change in the space that we work in and how are we trailblazing and doing things new and different that make that greatest impact. Jonathan Carlin from Montana spoke about how seeing bipartisanship in action inspired him and how it will impact his future work. This experience has inspired me in a lot of ways. I'll pick one, and that would be that it's inspired me to actively pursue bipartisanship. And we got to hear from governors from states where, I'll give an example, former governor of Montana, Steve Bullock, he was in a state where in order for him to get anything done to achieve his priorities, he had to be bipartisan. He was a Democrat and he had a Republican legislature. He achieved amazing things in the state of Montana during his tenure. And then we also got to hear from Governor Dugard in the state of South Dakota, who was a Republican governor with a Republican legislature. And he still chose to be incredibly bipartisan, even though maybe he didn't have to be. But the theme that I learned was that bipartisanship produces the best results. And whether or not you have to be bipartisan, bipartisan to get something done, bipartisanship is going to produce the best outcomes. One moment that stands out for me is a conversation I had with Arizona Governor Doug Ducey, who's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. And we were 
talking about the parties, about issues, and about political polarization. And it was just a conversation that a lot of people don't get to have. But it was just illuminating even how much common ground that we had on and frustrations with the divisiveness currently in our political system. And so it was, I guess, a conversation that in a lot of ways sort of opened my eyes to just how even brief discussions among people that on paper might not have a ton in common or see eye to eye on a lot of things. Just having that discussion and being in a situation that facilitates those conversations are not only important for my own professional growth, but also for our democracy. One of the things that becomes clear listening to lots of different governors, both current and former, is that the problems that they deal with on a day-to-day basis, those are not partisan. Those affect everyday people. Republicans and Democrats are both affected by natural disasters, housing, so many things, and achieving solutions for these problems that affect everybody requires ideas to come from all different sides, Republicans, Democrats, and everything in between. And a lot of these governors in reflecting upon their biggest accomplishments talk about this willingness to see good ideas from wherever they come from. And that might be within the political process. It might be from completely apolitical sources from folks in the community. Let's add one thing as well in that among the delegates, for which there's one or two from each state, There's a tremendous amount of diversity, and in some ways it's a microcosm of the larger Western governors meeting in that we all have our own life experience, our own political views, our own policy interests. And so we get to, in some ways, debrief a lot of both the sessions of the Western governors meeting as well as the speakers in our leadership institute. And we get to get each other's thoughts on it. And oftentimes what one delegate would take away was something completely different than what I took away, but incredibly valuable. And I think that that's something that being able to get these diverse perspectives on really important issues are something that we need to do a lot more of. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out West, presented by the Western Governors Association. To learn more about the Western Governors Foundation and its Leadership Institute, please visit westgov.org foundation. And be sure to join us next time as we continue to discuss critical issues facing the Western United States. Finally, WGA would like to thank the delegates, governors, and other friends of WGA who helped make the inaugural Western Governors Leadership Institute such a resounding success. Happy trails, everyone.